morning and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Tonight, COVID-19 expands its footprint across rural America, adding strain to small health care facilities and creating new challenges for remote residents, many who serve as essential workers. Now, we know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight, we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to get some answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join our conversation. We're opening our phone lines right now. We welcome you to the discussion tonight. 877-731-6733. And joining us live from the University of Nebraska Omaha, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We also welcome Executive Director of Emergency Management and Biopreparedness, Shelley Schwedhelm. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Gold, let's start with an overview. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? Uh, well, Christina, the, uh, the numbers uh, just do continue to grow across the United States, and we can look at the first graphic and go through those relatively quickly. I'm sure most of our audience know that we have now exceeded 8 million confirmed cases of COVID across the country, and tragically, just under 220,000 deaths. As recently as yesterday, uh, we confirmed uh, over 47,000 new cases. As a matter of fact, the day before, we were over 60,000 new cases in our nation. And that's a 30 percent increase over the last 14 days. And the 14-day increase is particularly important because that's roughly the cycle from exposure uh, to contagion to uh, transmission to testing to uh, confirmation of a, of a positive test. Our, our next graphic looks at the map of the United States, and what it shows very clearly is that early on in the pandemic, we saw a lot of bright red spots uh, along the east coast, along the southern coast, and along the western coast, and that's not what we're seeing right now. We're seeing a ton of COVID, uh, certainly if you look at the uh, Wisconsin area, but all throughout the Midwest and the Great Plains, there are very large areas of bright red uh, that are continuing to show spread. Our, our next graphic uh, is particularly important, and that gives us a look at the number of cases per day going back to the very beginning of the pandemic. So you see that in April and early May nationwide, we had a peak, then it fell off slightly, and then came up again in late July, early August. It fell down again, <clears throat> never getting below, uh, much below 25 or 30,000 uh, cases, uh, and now uh, we're over uh, 200 cases per million per day uh, in the United States, which is uh, just an astounding number uh, given all of the factors. And if you look at the, this simultaneous run, this is looking at the number of deaths per day in our nation. And what you see here is that we did see this early peak, and think about the uh, epicenter is in New York and New Jersey. And, California and Washington. Uh, and then, of course, we saw another peak when Florida and, uh, you know, North and South Carolina uh, seemed to peak out, Texas. But now we're in a basically a plateau. And we've been vacillating between 300 and 500, sometimes as many as 700 deaths confirmed uh, due to COVID uh, per day in America. And, it, you know, coming back to your question, the next graphic shows you that these are the top states uh, in the country, and I'm not very proud that my home state, Nebraska, is on that list. But this is telling you this is cases per week per 100,000 population. You know, 619 in North Dakota, South Dakota, 532, Montana, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Iowa, add to that Kansas, and, you know, just a, a large number of the breadbasket of the United States is so affected by the rapid transmission in our urban and in our rural communities. And then the final graphic that I want to show you at this part of the show, uh, Christina, looks at not the number of cases, but the number of deaths in rank order in the United States. And again, what you see is that North Dakota, Arkansas, South Dakota, Missouri, Kansas, and Montana are in the top in the number of deaths in the last seven days uh, per 100,000. So we are seeing across rural America a continued increase in the number of cases, we're seeing an increase in the number of hospitalizations, which we'll have a chance to unpack in the next few minutes and the impact of that. 
And tragically, we are actually seeing a, a significant number of the deaths that are occurring in our nation. So this is the time to be super careful. Absolutely, especially because it's a busy time around the farm as well. Harvest is ongoing across much of the Midwest. Shelly, you're no stranger to how the farm works. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Remind us of your ag background, and then if you will, talk about some of the lessons that you've learned from the pandemic since you last joined us. Sure. Well, I'm a farm girl um, by background, so I've, I've always lived on a farm, whether that's been in how I've uh, grown up or uh, dairy farming or even today. Uh, my husband and I have a, a little over 100 acres where we uh, raise cattle and hops and uh, grow our own uh, alfalfa as well. So anyway. So a little bit about my background. I'm a nurse by training and focused a lot in my career on infection prevention, emergency management. And since the COVID outbreak, I've had an opportunity to really spend time, particularly here in our state, in many of the uh, different kind of uh, diverse uh, areas that really needed some additional support, whether that was meat packing, long-term care, shelters, uh, and so on. So, and most recently schools. So, um, what I've learned is that a lot of the tried and true practices that we put in place uh, back then and said were best practices uh, still hold true today. So masking is uh, critically important and reduces uh, transmission as well as good hand hygiene, social distancing, and just uh, generally uh, making sure that you're not going places when you're ill. So those all hold true today. All right. We have so many questions. We already have callers lining up, our phone lines lighting up upstairs. But we want to start with a question tonight from Alan Morgan. He's the CEO of the National Rural Health Association, and he's wondering about fatigue amongst rural health care providers. Let's listen. We're hearing multiple cases from our membership across the United States, where in particular nursing staff um, are, are leaving their jobs because of the severe stresses they're seeing from dealing with surges of COVID-19 patients in a rural context. Could you talk a little bit about that and what are some possible strategies to address this rural COVID burnout that we're seeing among our providers? Yeah, Mr. Morgan, uh, that's a really important observation. And I can tell you, uh, I don't think there's any part of the country where the healthcare professionals are, are not seeing fatigue, overwork, long hours, and frankly, a lot of stress. Many of them have young kids who may or may not be in school or on home instruction. Others, uh, maybe their significant other uh, is out of work for one reason or another. And then, of course, the ultimate fear of bringing the virus home. But Shelly, you've actually visited a ton of rural hospitals, met yeah. with the nurses and healthcare staff. Uh, what's that experience like? Yeah. Well, first of all, they're doing a tremendous job out there. And in many cases, they're spending time, um, you know, really supporting each other through some of their unique challenges, whether that is trying to, to be teacher to their uh, children at home or uh, getting to their job on time at the, the hospital or the long-term care facility or wherever. So having a resilience uh, focus in the work environment, I think is so important today. So uh, teaching our staff sort of those self um, protocols that they can put in place when they sense that they're uh, becoming overly stressed, having an outlet for them, people to speak to, uh, engaging other mental health resources and making sure that that's sort of a normalized situation and debriefing I think many times helps too so whether that's after a critical event or a tremendously busy day or as you're kicking off your shift um, all of those things and really talking through um, kind of coping and, and how we can support each other is really really important. It's interesting the point that he brings up about rural fatigue in some of these smaller hospitals. And I know, Dr. Gold, that you're always looking out for your staff. Now, you brought up last time you were on that you're having a hard time. All the students that are wanting to come into the Nebraska Medical Center, you're having a hard time because you have such an influx of students right now. But he was just pointing out how some people might be considering even leaving the field because it's so difficult. So I was wondering if you could just kind of reconcile mm -hmm. what's happening out there. Well, certainly we have seen no uh, fall off in individuals that are interested in uh, furthering their career in the health professions. All time high enrollment in nursing, med school, pharmacy, dentistry. Uh, we've actually seen a doubling in the number of students that have uh, enrolled 
in our public health graduate programs, our MPH programs. And so uh, from a student perspective, <clears throat> we're seeing a huge amount of interest, a huge amount of volunteerism and compassion and, uh, and community service. Indeed, even when we were on remote education in the spring, and we're back to pretty much full uh, speed education on campus now, but when we were uh, back in the spring, we had students volunteering in churches and schools and, uh, and all across the community in everything from serving hot meals in long-term care facilities uh, to working with child care groups and, and the kinds of things, you know, that really pull at your heartstrings that, that make you so proud to be a health care professional. These young women and young men are going to be amazing members of the team when they get their degrees and when they graduate. But it also gave them, I think, and Shelley, you comment on this as well, a real upfront and personal uh, experience about how much sacrifice is involved in doing this because uh, these are long hours, a lot of stress, sick patients. Uh, you know, these are not things to uh, internalize easily. Yeah, I think uh, all of those are great points, uh, Chancellor Gold. And the thing that I think I just continue to think about is whether. Um, you know, some of these folks who weren't in the, the healthcare profession prior or public health leaders as well um, out there right now are such role models, right, for the path of contribution for folks that uh, this maybe encouraged them uh, if they hadn't thought of healthcare as a career option, that maybe this is an encouragement to them uh, seeing sort of what's going on in their, their path of contribution to help with that. So I think it can go both ways. I think people... Um, while struggling, I, I think we all went into this for the very same reason, and that is um, really to help others. So um, the very thing that's hard on us, I think, is also motivating to many. Love it. Very, very well said, both of you. And yeah, it's, it's hard from this vantage point to kind of watch what's happening in the medical community, but I know that everybody is so grateful for the American doctors out there, the nurses out there, everybody who's put themselves in harm's way just to go to work every single day. So we tip our hats to you. Our next question comes from Doug in Iowa, who reached out on social media. He says, packing plants have been able to keep outbreaks down for a couple of months now. Is that because of herd immunity or masks and social distancing? Which is helping more? Oh, this is a great question for <laughs> Shelly. Shelly, I don't know how many dozens yeah. of uh, meat processing facilities uh, you have visited. Uh, uh, I'm going to guess uh, it's not herd immunity, but it's best practices. But, uh, you know, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's a, a definite work in progress. I think uh, we've been probably in the state of Nebraska. Well, I know I've been to 15 of them uh, with about another 10 uh, or so that I've done uh, technical assistance with. It, it's definitely masking, definitely distancing, definitely putting in those engineering controls, so the barriers on the work line. And, and really very important in this is the workforce uh, communication and education and those policies by the uh, meat packing plant leaders to make sure that we have a non-punitive uh, approach to uh, illness and really encouraging people to stay home when they're ill. Is there more work to be done in that regard? Absolutely. Um, I think that there's going to always be this gap uh, between uh, leaders and frontline, and uh, the more that uh, there can be groups that really focus in and, and approach that uh, in a meaningful way is going to be very helpful in the long run, whether it's this outbreak or, or anything uh, to come. Oh, anything to come? <laughs> Are you already going to go there, Shelley? <laughs> come on, we got to get through this one first. Yeah, let's, let's, let's not go there, right? Especially, my, my job is preparedness, so I'm always <laughs> thinking about what's next. <laughs> I appreciate that. We don't want to be caught off guard by anything, especially mm -hmm. we still have a couple months left in this year. Shelley, have we learned anything, just speaking on that vein, have we learned any lessons on transmission based on what we've seen in our schools? Well, maybe not particularly about schools, but what we uh, have learned is that this pathogen can hang in the air for a little bit of time. So all of that is driven by uh, airflow, uh, engineering um, systems, uh, lots of different situations, whether it's an indoor environment, um, things like that. So we know that 
With that sort of transmission, that the risk is not just necessarily six feet now. It's, it can be greater than that. And so you really have to do a risk assessment when you're thinking about spending time indoors. So for the most part, the schools that are being successful are those that have uh, required masking that have worked really hard to distance or um, de-densify the number of children in the school and in the classrooms at a given time based upon community transmission, and then uh, really making sure that uh, there's good hand washing as well. So all those things seem to uh, be working in our favor, and you know, eventually here we're hoping to also get some testing uh, capability as well to sort of pick things up much quicker uh, in some of these uh, indoor environments. You know, one of the things we did learn, uh, I think, at least in our own local experience, is that the overwhelming majority of transmission in school-age children and in college-age uh, students doesn't occur uh, in school. Mm -hmm. That it's still occurring in right. the community. <clears throat> it's occurring at social gatherings on weekends. Uh, it's occurring, uh, you know, unfortunately in restaurants and bars. Uh, and, and other such things that, uh, you know, school-age children uh, tend to uh, avail themselves of. And so while we have worked, I think, pretty successfully in our state, at least, and I'm sure in other places as well, uh, to reduce the spread, uh, you know, if you look at some, we have a graphic, I think, that shows this, that if you look across the United States, uh, the number of universities that have now confirmed uh, COVID cases is uh, well over 1,500, and about 175,000 uh, college-age students have been confirmed uh, to be infected uh, with COVID. But the, in, the thing that is really tragic that may not be known to our audience is that of that group, as rare as it is, 70 of them have actually died from COVID. Mm. So you think about, you know, we don't think about college-age kids getting so sick that they need to be hospitalized or, heaven forbid, uh, become a fatality from COVID, and yet that has become a reality across our country. Granted, small numbers, but if one of those 70 kids <clears throat> is your family member or next-door neighbor, uh, believe me, we care an awful lot about that, and uh, we certainly wouldn't wish that on anybody's family. Oh, every life matters. Tom from Colorado is our next caller. Thanks for joining the conversation. Tom, go right ahead. Okay, thanks for taking my call. Uh, we watch Dr. Gold every week. Uh, my question is, uh, the World Health Organization, who came out with this statement this week saying that uh, remdesivir isn't effective, and I know Dr. Gold has mentioned that that is one of the treatments in, here in the United States that we use, and I'm wondering what he's thought of this. Thank you. Yeah, Tom, so let's clear that up a little bit. The only prospective randomized scientific studies on remdesivir have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that it reduces hospital stay in individuals who are hospitalized with COVID with a very significant trend, not, not conclusive, but a very significant trend towards reducing death rates of hospitalized patients. Now, in a large study recently uh, done by the World Health Organization, there were a number of places uh, that added up that showed that it was a minimal effect, meaning it did not achieve statistical significance, but it wasn't prospective and it wasn't randomized. And so it comes down, Tom, to a very important question is, how does the science help us weigh in on making these decisions? And the highest quality studies that we can do. And, you know, the science changes every day about COVID. You know, uh, a drug is good, a drug is bad, a vaccine works, a vaccine stopped. You know, we, we can talk about that as much as you wish. But as I sit here today, the only quality scientific studies organized by the National Institutes of Health that look at remdesivir alone or remdesivir in combination with other drugs, anti-inflammatory agents, steroids, uh, other, other uh, so-called COX-2 inhibitors have shown that there's a significant value for treatment with remdesivir. And of course, as you probably know, uh, even the president of the United States was treated with remdesivir, among other things, uh, when he was hospitalized with COVID. And that's because the physicians making the decision to treat him and the, and the physicians making the decisions in our hospitals here in our community understand the science and decided to use remdesivir as a part of the treatment. And it's quite a bit more 
widely available now, isn't it, Dr. Gold? I'm hearing that at many major hospitals at this point, you can get remdesivir. Absolutely. Uh, and indeed, uh, it has become, uh, and Shelley would be better articulate than I am, but it's pretty much the staple of uh, hospitalized patients now, a five-day course, right? It is. And all of uh, the critical access rural hospitals also have access to remdesivir now. So, Which I think is one of the reasons we're seeing more treatment mm -hmm. in critical access hospitals, because they yes. feel more comfortable that they've got a so-called uh, arrow in their quiver that they can use against this disease when it gets really severe. All right. On that note, we are going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center, world-renowned doctor, Chancellor Jeffrey Gold. We also welcome Executive Director of Emergency Management and Biopreparedness. Shelley Schwedhelm joins us tonight. We're going to go right back to our viewer questions. Our next question from Logan of Idaho. He says, I need a lung cancer screening and wonder how safe it is to visit a hospital. It's two hours away from where I live and there's always a long wait in the office, so I've been putting it off. Yeah, Logan, why don't I start and uh, give you my own two cents uh, on this, uh, and that is that you should not delay important diagnostic tests and treatments, particularly something like a lung cancer screening. So what I would do is I would call your healthcare professionals where you're going to be screened uh, and make sure you have an appointment and then do what a lot of us do, which is just ask you to sit in your car until they're ready for you so you're not sitting in the waiting room. Uh, and then when they're ready, uh, but be sure to wear your mask, uh, and, and then they'll give you very specific instructions. Typically, if your medical center is like ours, uh, they'll ask you whether you've had any symptoms, whether you've been exposed, et cetera. And so what we have seen is because of all the delays for diagnostic testing, all the mammograms, lung scan, cancer screening, colonoscopies, pap tests, et cetera, we are seeing a huge backlog of later stage cancers and people who have missed their screening. So my strongest advice to you, Logan, is go get screened. Would you agree with that, Shelley? I don't have much to add, uh, Chancellor Gold. I really think that you're absolutely spot on with all those suggestions. And I think, honestly, if COVID has taught us anything, I think it's how to be a little bit more uh, customer focused and personal approach. So. I like the idea of just making sure that you communicate with the office, that you'll make a phone call and they can just let you know when it's time for you to walk in and go right into the exam room. That should be part of what we do every day if it were that easy, right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. See, we're learning from ourselves. <laughs> Next up is Gabrielle from California. She asks on social media, we sell wildflower honey at the Davis Farmers Market and business is picking up. Do you have any tips to help us create a healthy environment for our customers? Well, that's a tough one, uh, Gabrielle, because uh, most farmers markets, uh, you know, at least the ones that I'm used to, uh, have a lot of people. They're really enjoying not just the produce, uh, but they're enjoying the socialization. Uh, and it's, you know, and I can tell you, uh, that, that's been a Saturday morning tradition in my life uh, for my family uh, for decades to go to the local farmer's market and get the very best of the very freshest produce that's obviously seasonally uh, related. So again, it's going to come down to social distancing, hand sanitizers, wearing masks, uh, using as little cash exchange as possible uh, so that there's nothing that really changes hands. Do you have any suggestions uh, for Gabrielle, Shelley? I think, uh, Gabrielle, what I would suggest is just trying to uh, spread people out more so than what we've seen in our typical farmer's markets. So granted, it will have people walk a little bit more, but having space between the various exhibits and then also probably limiting um, access to uh, food that you would consume or drink that you would consume in the farmer's market, which would cause people to need to remove their mask. So um, the more you can just be consistent with masking and distancing and uh, maybe have some hand hygiene products available intermittently throughout the uh, 
area, that would be great too. So uh, no hot cider, huh? No hot cider, mm -hmm. no coffee, yeah. <laughs> So. Just have to wait until it's safe again. Speaking of which, let's get up to date with the latest on the vaccine front. Dr. Gold, how close are we now? So we continue to get uh, closer, Christina. You know, at, as, uh, as of today, uh, there are uh, just over 40 different vaccines that are either in phase one or phase two uh, safety testing, 46 according uh, to this graphic. Uh, and there are 11 uh, that are in phase three. Uh, the warp speed vaccines, you know, think the Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, uh, &J and others are uh, really at the head of the pack, uh, but they are now in the efficacy high volume testing, which means that they're gonna be testing in between 20 and 40,000 individuals uh, to uh, determine both safety and efficacy. I am still optimistic that some of these phase three trials uh, will end in a matter of weeks to months. Uh, you know, I've been predicting that at least one of them will be done before Santa drops down the chimney and maybe uh, even slightly sooner than that. But, you know, just because the trial is done doesn't mean that the vaccine is shipped, that it's deployed within a state, and that it's actually in the arms of the people that really need it. And what I mean by that is, so for instance, at least one of the vaccines has to be shipped at a very cold temperature, uh, which has got all kinds of logistical issues with it, and actually has to be injected within 30 minutes of when it comes out of that cold temperature. Now, in response to the Food and Drug Administration and the CDC in the Warp Speed Project, each of the states had to submit a protocol as to how are we going to do it, how are we going to distribute it, ship it and uh, how we're gonna prioritize who gets it first, which is likely gonna be the older, more vulnerable uh, individuals, plus the frontline healthcare workers and other essential uh, workers uh, uh, in our state. So I, that is not gonna happen overnight, and I'm gonna predict that that's gonna take months to even get a reasonable penetration across rural and urban uh, America. You know, hopefully it'll be faster than that, but we need to garner more experience with these vaccines in larger, what we call the post-clinical trial phase, the post-deployment phase, which would be the phase four part of the rollout. And we're just gonna have to see uh, you know, how long it lasts, uh, what the side effects are, and, uh, and how effective it is in, uh, in blunting the transmission of COVID. Yeah, and you know, states seem to be getting involved, and so this may complicate things a little bit more. Governor Newsom of California, just a couple hours ago, he announced that he will review COVID vaccines that are approved by the FDA with his own scientific safety review board. And so this is something that we could actually see coming from other states that could prolong that timeline. Have you heard anything about that? Sure. Well, I, I think the, what the governor said makes perfect sense. But the truth of the matter is, is that when two or three or five or even just one vaccine comes on the market, you know, you or I, what are we going to do? We're going to call up our trusted healthcare professional, our advanced practice nurse or our PA or our physician, our primary care, uh, and say, listen, if you were me, which of these vaccines uh, do I need based on my age and any comorbidity uh, that I might have? And do you recommend that I get it now or do you recommend that I wait? And what is the professional going to do? They're going to go straight to the scientific literature. They're going to say, based on experience in 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 uh, people that are immunized, the vaccine is this safe and it's that effective, particularly in people your age. And, you know, I'm guessing that we're going to have vaccines that are more effective in children, others that are more effective in older adults. Some are going to need one dose, some are going to need two doses over a period of time. But I'm going to guess, without absolute transparency of the scientific data, it's going to be really tough for the prescribing community uh, to say that you should get one vaccine or another, make a choice, or get any vaccine. And so I think what Governor Newsom is saying is that the science is going to rule, which uh, I think is going to be widely present uh, across the country and should be, because at the end of the day, uh, all of us are just going to go to our trusted uh, sources. I mean, do you see any difference in that, Shelley? I don't. And I think, you know, uh, you mentioned the priority groups to begin with, and it will take time, but there'll be tiers within that. Um, those big, 
you know, groupings too. You know, it isn't probably just the frontline healthcare workers. It's those who are maybe uh, the most vulnerable with people who are ill. So our primary care clinics, our, our public health folks out there, um, and uh, our emergency department and, and first responders. And some of our long-term care sites. Yes, that as well. All right. Our next question is for Shelly. And Shelly, this is a question that I posed, I believe, to you when you were on last time. We were talking about transmission and how people are most commonly getting coronavirus based on what we've learned at this point through scientific research, of course. How are most people getting this infection? What are you finding? Is it happening through conversations, for example? Yeah, we know uh, certain things uh, put you at higher risk. So uh, yelling, cheering, uh, things like that. But um, we are seeing also in locations where people are masked, uh, that transmission is far less. So um, we just know that there are behaviors and risks. And uh, I would just suggest that everybody do a risk assessment. Anytime you're invited to go somewhere or to do an activity, think about how many people are going to be there. Will they be wearing masks? Uh, is it indoor? Is it outdoor? So there's all sorts of questions you should ask yourself. Um, and then what are the activities that are going to happen while you're there? So you know, we'll, we'll there, was, there was a very large study that was just published by the CDC looking at states uh, in which there were mask mandates. And what they showed absolutely conclusively uh, is, is that, the, uh, that, that restaurants and bars were the highest transmission areas. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because if you're going to go out to dinner, you're going to take off your mask, right? You're going to go out to have a drink, you're right. going to take off your, your mask. And, uh, and that's where the transmission occurs. So uh, th there's no magic about where this is happening and what's causing the spread. We all know that right now. It's personal contact, aerosolized and droplet spread, close quarters, lower Crowded. amounts of air circulation, mm -hmm. and, and not masking. Correct. Okay. Our next question is from John of Iowa. He says, we raise feeder pigs in Hamilton and everything with everything going on, I feel like my blood pressure has been much higher than normal this year. Does that make me more susceptible to coronavirus? Well, John, I think everybody's blood pressure is a little bit higher this year <laughs> for uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, but the answer to the question is yes. If you have hypertension or if you have diabetes, uh, if you've been treated for cancer or are being treated for cancer or some other immunologic problem, if you have known lung disease or heart disease, you are at higher risk uh, of not just getting infected but of getting hospitalized. And unfortunately, you're at higher risk for a fatality. I mean, if you look at the total number of deaths that have occurred in the United States, uh, average more than 50% have occurred in a long-term care facility. And Shelley, you've visited a lot of those long-term care facilities and nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, I don't envy that staff at all in those settings. Yeah, it's a really hard time out there in assisted living and long-term care, uh, staffing shortages. Uh, and then, you know, the folks that they counted on from agencies, uh, some of which are not allowing their staff to work when uh, the, the environment uh, has COVID. So, um, being short-staffed, uh, trained to care for uh, vulnerable adults, uh, who some of which are COVID positive. Um, I think, you know, uh, some situational things occurred, particularly in our state. We've seen some increasing numbers in those facilities again now in the last month or so, six weeks or so, uh, with, you know, anytime you open a little bit more to visitation and um, schools are back in session, so parents, you know, are more susceptible to potentially um, COVID than they were when we were in lockdown. So uh, we are seeing increasing cases all across the United States in these facilities, and it is uh, a very difficult time. All right. Our next question is from Carolyn of Maine. She writes, I'd like my grandkids to come and visit for Thanksgiving, and I'm willing to pay to get each a COVID test in town before they arrive at our farm. Is there enough testing available now to make this work? Well, in terms of availability, I would say the testing is available. In terms of reliability, a lot depends on what kind of test we're talking about. 
But in terms of what it actually means to you, Carolyn, to have your grandchildren and what your disease risk would be, is, uh, you know, it's still a roll of the dice. And I will tell you, that's exactly the conversation that my family and I are having. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, you know, we actually have great-grandma in, uh, in the equation right now, and uh, great-grandma wants to see the great-grandkids and the grandkids. Uh, and uh, we are thinking long and hard about that right now. But in terms of your very specific question, Carolyn, yes, both PCR tests, antigen tests, point-of-care tests, hopefully very soon saliva tests will be widely available, and I think before the Thanksgiving holidays. Uh, if you're going to do it, I would make sure that they are tested literally uh, within days of, of when you're going to see them. Do you have other thoughts on that, Shelley? No, I think that was well stated. Uh, I have nine grandkids, too many of which I haven't seen for a long time. So I'm really thinking hard about this uh, situation as well and trying to decide how to bring in the, the great-grandparents as well. And I, I don't see a good strategy, unfortunately. Well, that's, you know, I, I guess, Carolyn, that's what I'm saying as well. And uh, as sad as what I'm about to say may sound to you is uh, we're probably going to defer the family gathering, which we would normally have at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in our family has been the holiday in which everybody travels in from across the country and gets together. Uh, and uh, we just made a decision that we're not going to do it this year. It's so hard to hear that. You know, every family has unique situation. Every family is different. And so what is your advice to people as we do look to family gatherings, holidays coming up? We won't be able to be outdoors because it's getting cold in a lot of states across the country. And it seems like now it's up to the individual more than anything else. What is your guidance as we start to make these decisions? I mean, uh, there's, there's no perfect answer to this. It's going to vary a lot from family to family and individual to individual. A lot depends, uh, in my mind, on how old and what comorbidities members of the family have. But, you know, in any family, particularly if you're talking about a relatively large number of brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, uh, there's going to be somebody that's got some underlying medical problem that puts them at particularly higher risk, which, by the way, you may or may not know about for, you know, they just may that's not true. be totally open about that. And so uh, the decision we've made uh, is that it's going to be immediate family only. Uh, all the travel, of course, is going to be on masks. Uh, it's going to be mostly car travel. We're not going to ask anybody uh, to get into a plane or a train or, or take a bus uh, because of the risk of exposure. I think that, you know, these large groups of transportation are, you know, many cruise ships in many different ways. Not to say that they're not getting better and safer in some recently very uh, reassuring data from air travel. But, you know, Carolyn, uh, I think a year from now, uh, I think it's going to be a lot safer. I do believe that vaccines will be around. I think we'll have a much better handle on effective antivirals and hopefully we'll be on the tail end of, of this pandemic. And so, uh, you know, we, we're asked to do a lot of things that, uh, these days that are far from pleasant and certainly not our normal way of life. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, if one of the grandkids got sick or if one of the uh, grandparents uh, got sick as a result of a holiday gathering uh, or got hospitalized or, heaven forbid, passed away, uh, I, don't, I just don't want to be uh, part of that equation. So, uh, as I said, uh, we're going to punt. Yeah, I think... Uh the other thing I'm thinking about is we've had some really nice Thanksgivings as far as weather goes. So mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with rural America and our barns and oh, uh, yeah. masking, uh, being outside. And, you know, then when you eat, uh, going over there and grabbing a hay bale and moving it out, you know, and distancing people mm -hmm. to do that. So I might play it by ear on whether I buy my turkey within the 10 days prior to Thanksgiving <laughs> and see, see what we might be able to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little it, desperate, though. so we'll no, see. That, that's a good plan, Shelly. I like that. I, I, I might call you up if I'm desperate. Go. <laughs> so wear the mask and still have that opportunity to, to have those family memories, just keep everybody safe. I love that. And I do have to ask, Dr. Gold, do you ever get involved in the cooking at a Gold family Thanksgiving? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, I get 
So, you know, as, you're, as the audience probably knows, I spent 25 years as a uh, cardiac surgeon. So the only surgery that I get to do routinely these years is to uh, carve dinner uh, on, on Thanksgiving. But yeah, no, I uh, do love to cook. Uh, fortunately, my uh, daughter and my wife are far more gifted at it than uh, I am. So I just, to get, just get to enjoy their, uh, uh, their labors, which are fantastic. <laughs> There's some talented hands carving the turkey at the Gold Residence. All right, thank you for that moment just to kind of exhale a little bit. We all have the holidays coming. It's been a tough year, so I appreciate that. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Right after this, I want to give you the number one more time, though, so you can join us, 877-731-6733. We still have time for your call, 877-731-6733. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And tonight we also welcome Executive Director of Emergency Management and Biopreparedness, Shelly Schwedhelm. We're going to go right back to the phones. I want to make sure you have that number, 877-731-6733. John from Iowa, you're up next. Go right ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Once you have catch the coronavirus, can you get it again? So, John, uh, the answer to that question is probably yes, but extremely, extremely rarely. There are now just a tiny handful of confirmed cases of individuals who got it a second time. And tragically, there are actually even a smaller number of individuals who did get it a second time, who have actually gotten hospitalized and passed away from it. There are a number of people in their late 80s that fell into that category. And it shouldn't come as a total surprise because we know that as you get older, your immune system gets weaker, that your ability to make antibodies and to have uh, effective what we call cellular immunity, meaning the immunity from your lymphocytes, uh, becomes weaker as well. And so, uh, fortunately, it is extremely rare, and there's a lot of good data now that is showing that not only do you make high-quality and high-titer antibodies if you get infected, but that even as the antibody levels fall over time, as they do after all infections, that your white cells remember how to make COVID antibodies, which can be very effective in uh, knocking out the virus and preventing reinfection. So the overwhelming majority of individuals who are exposed after they've been infected will not get reinfected again. But the older individuals, those with comorbidities, uh, they probably will. Thank you for that call, John from Iowa. We appreciate that. Our next question is about the state just to the north of Iowa, Wisconsin. We have to include the Dakotas as well. All, all these states, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin, neighboring states, are being hit hard right now. Why did it take a little bit longer to get to this part of the country? And why is it hitting so hard at this moment in time right now? Yeah, so the, uh, the rural parts of America were protected early on uh, in the pandemic because of the tightness of the populations that we saw in, in the East Coast and in the West Coast. So you think about New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Dallas, Gainesville, Miami, you know, large, tightly knit, dense communities where super spreader events could not only spread in a long term care facility, but would catch on like wildfire uh, in the community. But over time, those super spreader events started to come to rural communities. And as we started to open up and reestablish the ability to go to school, to go to church, uh, even small social gatherings, reestablish time in restaurants and in bars, uh, and continue to loosen uh, the uh, public health measures, uh, we started to see more spread in, uh, in rural America. And uh, now uh, we are seeing, you know, in the state of Nebraska, Shelley and I were just talking about it, we're seeing faster transmission rates in the rural communities than we're seeing in the larger cities uh, in Nebraska and in the surrounding states. And that is not going to stop, John. Uh, so we are going to have to be extra careful, particularly as the weather's getting colder. We still have students back in class. 
So, for instance, today was the first day of in-person attendance at high schools uh, in the uh, Omaha metro uh, public school system. So, you know, obviously all kinds of precautions, safety testing and, and things of that nature are all in place. And, you know, again, I wouldn't want to trade places uh, with the superintendent of the public school districts who have to make these very hard decisions. But, you know, it's uh, all with an abundance of caution and, uh, and being very, very aware of what can happen if one of these super spreaders take over. All right. Thank you so much for that call. Gary from Pennsylvania, you are up next. Go right ahead. Yes, uh, we're close 80 years old. We go to church and we wear our masks. A lot of the other people don't. How susceptible are we to it? Well, you're certainly uh, protecting yourself somewhat, but you would be much more protected if others wore a mask. And uh, while I understand that in some of the rural communities there's an attitude that, uh, uh, that you know, the, the virus is not going to spread and that masks may be unnecessary, let me just say this very clearly. Uh, this is not a political decision. This is a medical decision. There is no question that facial protection with masks that covers your mouth and nose, and also, by the way, if you wear glasses and cover your eyes, you're going to reduce the chance of transmitting infection, and you're going to reduce the chance of getting infected. So whether it's in church or in school or in, even in a family gathering, anything particularly indoors, uh, facial protection is the name of the game. I mean, wouldn't you agree, Shelley? Totally agree. Uh, I've just finished being on our reopening of our church mm -hmm. uh, committee, and uh, we carefully considered all of these things because it's a rural community, and uh, we just said the evidence is that masking matters, and so we very carefully reduced the number of available spots for worship and said these are the rules of engagement. It isn't about... It's about keeping our church members safe. So I think um, while putting all that together, I think that that, you know, there's also many opportunities to worship online. So if people don't want to wear a mask, they can worship online and still be part of the church. So it's just a matter of, I think, leadership making those tough calls and your church council. What's great about worshiping online is you can do it anytime. You can take your phone with you and you can play that worship music. And right now, that's one of the things I know bringing a lot of people peace out there. Okay, so we're in this weird time frame. It's fall allergy season, cold and flu season is ramping up. And of course, we have COVID-19. I just wanted to see if you can remind everybody when to take a test. Well, certainly, uh, well, let's just stay with uh with uh, flu influenza, flu season for just a minute, <clears throat> we strongly, strongly recommend that everybody get their flu vaccine. That, that should not be a controversial decision either and not wait uh, at all. Uh, and hopefully we can keep the flu hospitalizations and deaths down to a bare minimum this year. So the, the current recommendations, and I'm going to ask Shelley to comment in a minute and correct me if I missed any changes in the recommendations, is anybody that is symptomatic or anybody that has had an exposure to somebody that has known COVID for more than 15 minutes or less than six feet needs to be tested. Uh, is, is that pretty much the, the current recommendation? That's correct. Um, in addition to that, many organizations are moving towards dual testing for influenza and COVID. Mm -hmm. So, for example, our health system implemented that uh, this week, that that's going to be uh, our approach. So we won't be any longer just doing COVID or just doing influenza testing. It's a dual testing strategy. That doesn't mean that the COVID testing uh, rapid test still wouldn't be available out there. Um, but again, it's going to depend on, you know, sort of your situation and whether the specificity and sensitivity is what you need um, at that point in time for testing. Now, you know, it's a little different if in other sectors. So, for instance, if you were to look at college football, I believe that some of the conferences are requiring daily antigen testing. Mm -hmm. And then on the day before the competition, or the day before the game, they're requiring a PCR test. I know we're working very closely with the National Collegiate Hockey League 
on developing some of those protocols. We've worked very closely with the Big Ten and the Big East and, and, and several others, and they are going to routine asymptomatic testing uh, because they're in these tightly knit pods of uh, professional and student athletes where the risk of contagion and spread is extremely high. Now, the antigen tests are somewhat less accurate because they're less sensitive, but nonetheless, uh, that has been a pretty successful methodology, which is why a lot of testing pays off. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. All right. Tim from Indiana is our next caller. Go right ahead, Tim. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, how often or frequent should you change your mask? Or and then, Because I, uh, my concern is you go to these different stores and you see everybody selling masks. I don't know how good they are now, but then you see people putting the mask on. You see them. I wear mine all week long. <laughs> I don't think that's right, but I just don't know what the protocol or what that would be. Yeah, Tim, you know, I think it depends a little bit on what type of mask we're talking about, whether it's a paper mask, a cloth mask, or a so-called N95 respirator. Shelley, what are we currently recommending to our staff? Yeah, so um, for a cloth mask, we really encourage people to use a three-ply, and cotton is still really the, the material of choice. So uh, that's what we would suggest, and, and laundering those daily. So the kids that are going to school, they should have a mask for uh, each day of the week, or at least have it you know, hand-washed or laundry-washed uh, once a day. And then as far as the paper masks or the procedure mask, um, we really suggest changing that out day, uh, one day, you know, every day. So um, again, it's going to be risk assessment based. So depending upon the line of work you're in, the amount of people you come in contact with, um, definitely try to not touch it, use good hand hygiene and all of those things and carefully take it off and carefully put it back on uh, between, you know, breaks and lunches and things like that. So. And after you take it off, you want to sanitize your hands, Correct. right? Okay. Um, over the next couple of weeks, a lot of people will be headed out for early voting. Many will be voting by mail. There's concerns for COVID in both cases. When it comes to early voting in person, I was hoping you can address that first. And then voting by mail, um, some people have been sanitizing their ballots. I was hoping you could address that as well. We only have a little bit of time left. Sure. No, just very briefly. Uh, I think all of, this, all of the states have put uh, all kinds of precautions in place uh, for voting uh, in person. And as far as sanitizing your ballots are concerned, uh, I would think long and hard about the boxes that you check on the ballot, but I don't think you need to medically sanitize them. <laughs> you heard it straight from Dr. Gold. Okay. I want to thank you both for joining us as always. Dr. Gold, we have a little bit of time if you want to give us some final thoughts as we move into this next week, still dealing with the pandemic. Yeah, just uh, very briefly to say that this is the time for every American to uh, lean in and to use all of the necessary measures. You know, I always wear my mask. I'm really proud of it. Uh, I want to try to set an example and protect others and protect myself. And uh, I hope all of you do, too. Please be well and please, please uh, be safe. All right. Thank you both so much for joining us. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Executive Director of Emergency Management and Biopreparedness, Shelley Schwemhelm. Thank you so much. And if we didn't get to your question tonight, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. The number is 855-776-6147. Go ahead and grab a pen and write that number down because you can record it at your convenience. 855-776-6147. We'll see you next Monday right here at 6 Eastern. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful night.